Perhaps, as I say to my students, every day is kind of cat day, uh, to which everybody hisses with great derision and, and distaste. But cats after rats, maybe even as much as rats, are responsible for a great deal of bird damage um, in, in the world. Um, the impacts, the US feral cats, I'm quoting now, killed more wild creatures than any other humanly induced cause, including automobiles, pesticides, and buildings that migratory birds collide with. And the cats have been introduced, they were introduced to New Zealand. They're actually one of them, I don't think I have that quote, do I? Yes, there's the quote. On Cook's resolution, it says that one of the cats regularly took a morning walk in the woods and made great havoc among, among the little, little birds. And this is from Gareth Morgan, who is at the moment trying to make a, a sort of one-man campaign and getting great threats and vilification in the media and from others for saying that, look, let's keep our cats indoors, especially in New Zealand. Not that this is going to make a great deal of difference, but you can see cats are a big problem, and if you're going to do a book on, on cats, you better deal with feral cats with a great deal of discretion uh, and not a lot, perhaps, of valor, but we'll have to see about that. Cats again, I'm still involved with cats. These are cats, these are cats upon cats. I mean, these are, these are, I mean, look at cats in, in Australia, common and abundant, that darker, the yellow is is common and the, and the um, burnt orange is abundant. And that's pretty impressive. It isn't just where they are, but look at the sizes of these things. Wonderful. If you're a cat, I want to be released in, in Australia. No problem there, mate. It's all right. Don't worry. No worries. But there we go. Cats then, with rats, with rodents, are, are looked on as extremely invasive and in need of... of uh, a good, a good deal of control. As I mentioned, and I'm still sticking to New Zealand for, for a little bit here, our attitudes were very, very different. We we're very confident. I wouldn't say arrogant, just confident that we could improve upon the systems in which we were, especially the colonial places. Who, what is possibly of use in Australia? Let us I mean, Australia has jumping deer and hopping. I mean, they have things with bristles on them. I mean, they have marsupials that no one on earth could understand or wanted to because there's only one in North America and I don't think any in Europe. So basically, it was an alien and, and very difficult plant and animal association to understand. And so what you do, of course, is you start to bring in and have that psychic and biological security of bringing in the right, the good places, so that you can recreate those landscapes in your own image, in a sense. And that's precisely what happened, as you can see from here. It was a very interesting time indeed. And um, I was just looking at my notes here to say that we have, in New Zealand, 23 acclimatization societies compared with only 11 set up in Australia. But the ones in Australia lasted into the 1930s, whereas the ones in New Zealand ended a little earlier uh, in, in 1903. But both colonial situations, both colonial nations, were intent upon improving the flora and fauna of these two important countries, adding to the thing that I, I found remarkable in the case of Australia, the, the, the bringing the eucalyptus out of Australia was a great boom in the, in, the, in the period's eyes to seeing this miracle tree that was going to solve malaria. It was going to be a wonderful um, track, uh, track, track for railroads, for a sleeper. It was going to do all kinds of things. And it was pushed out of, of uh, the Botanic Garden at Melbourne. Uh, and, and pushed out very effectively into France, into northern Africa, as well as into Kew Gardens. So this is one of the, the real successes of seeing Australia as, as a point, something you can really bring something out of very successfully. I'm not sure that it was a success in the longer term, 
thinking of plantation, agri plantation forestry in, in Brazil today that has probably more eucalypts than in Australia. But anyhow, it, that, that's, that's something that we can, we can talk about another time, perhaps. Not only are we dealing with these um, two major problems that I've mentioned, we're dealing in the case of New Zealand with uh, uh, several more, two of which are important here. This brush tailed possum, and as I said, there, there may be 30 million still ruffling about, bounding about, becoming roads casualties, uh, especially in North Island, New Zealand today, even though they've been halved through the Department of Conservation's in, intrepid efforts to try to deal with this. This is out of, as you see, Australia, uh, brought over, but it's a real, a real omnivore. It's a very successful animal indeed, and uh, one that is basically impossible to get rid of on the two North and South Islands. We're not dealing just with, with uh, birds and, and mammals. We're dealing with a whole, a whole cadre of, of things like this. The Archie's frog is a very primitive group. Uh, one of four, about 70 million years old. The, the wetter is this very interesting insect, a huge sort of horned grasshopper type thing, which is very large indeed. So all these endemic um, species are, are subject to predation by rats and, and cats and, and other introduced species, not just the, the birds that I've just been talking about, concentrating about. The light came on in New Zealand about 1958 to 1960, when people began to realize that something could be done. And what this map shows is what you do is you start small and work outwards to bigger islands. And so those are all small offshore groups. After all, New Zealand is basically an archipelago of, of a whole bunch of islands, over 100, I believe. And so what was being done was to, to, to look at these islands as these endemic species, as the very important colonial bird breeding sites, and to start to think about uh, what could be done. It starts off by a very small Maria Island in the, as you see, just with one to get this very interesting white-faced storm petrel back, which was clearly being affected by rats that had got onto the island. And actually, they, they put Warfin down and came back in 60, late 64, 65, and said, hey, there are no rats here. It must have worked. It was a sort of hit and miss thing, and it seemed to have worked. And then the big thing in South Cape, this was a very bad occasion that got national attention. In 64, a ship ran aground on, <coughs> off Stewart Island here and released rats. And within a couple of years, it had knocked out uh, uh, some endemic, a bush wren, a snipe. It had killed off the greatest short-tailed bat on that island. And this was extremely upsetting to a lot of people. And so they said, look, we've got to do something about this because you've got an extinction there. In this case, I don't think you can see this very well, I'm sorry, but it's this extinction of the short-tailed bat. And so what became... <clears throat> more of a, a program developed by the Department of, uh, of Conservation was to start to set up bait stations to start to organize traps and poisons that would start to whittle down. 1080 is never a good thing, but it's still being used, by the way. And this was a, a, a campaign that has grown much more sophisticated as New Zealanders have learned how to cope uh, very well indeed. This second generation anti-coagulant uh, DECON is the one, the, the, the control of choice now. It's a very effective, depends on the side effects of other species that are living there, but it's very effective on rodents. Because basically placed in cereal baits, the rodent, the individual rat or mouse, well rats, mice are a different thing. And most individual rats do not realize they're being poisoned until it's too late. Whereas with other baits, they did warfarin, for example. So what has been done then is to deal targets, target these islands, GPS them, go in with heavy equipment and a lot of baits and do it. Do it all at once. And what has happened is over time this has proven to be the best thing. Just go in with a sort of burnt, burnt, burnt approach, burnt, burnt um, what am I thinking, burnt, 
Scotch bone, uh, Scotch, Scotch bone <laughs> approach. Um, one of the biggest successes, the trouble is, uh, that's okay when they're, they're not inhabited. What happens when they're inhabited islands, inhabited by people, that is, have residents who care for their, their rats, and well, not rats, but maybe certainly cats, and so you've got a bit of a tricky one here. Capiti, any of you been off there? Capiti, it's a lovely place to go. It's only three files, miles off the southwest coast, uh, off the coast there, as you see on the right-hand side. A small island. But it's one of those sort of test, test cases. It's only five miles long by about 1.2 miles uh, wide. But it was taken on as a, as a project. Not simply to get the, the feral cattle and the sheep off, but then the opossums that have been uh, released there. That took a long time. There were many, many thousands taken off. And then the rats uh, eradicated by... 1998. The idea was to, to sort of cleanse this island of all exotics and then bring back through captive breeding or from other places the preferred animals that you wanted to do. And this is what happened. And it has been a remarkable success. You can go over the, the day trip. Uh, it's a lovely trip to take. You'll be searched when you get there and when you get especially when you get there, simply to try to make sure that you're not bringing in any, anything can, that can, uh, can start to repopulate the area. In fact, in 2010, a stoat was caught in on Capiti again. They don't know how it got there. They suspect it may have swum, but some people like to, to release these sorts of things anyhow. So this has been a, a, a really test case. It was a successful case. And it is still a, an island that has people go to to see the techniques that were used and the animals, particularly the birds, that were are brought back. So you have, with the IUCN then, a Species Survival Commission that was set up in 1949. And then the Reintroduction Specialist Groups, the Invasive Species Specialist Group, was founded in 1994. So that shows the sort of change of mind and the evolution of thinking. And so you have, through... IUCN inspired efforts, a real attempt to reintroduce a number of, of, of organisms successfully to New Zealand. This is the group I'm talking about. There is a, it's a volunteer group consisting of about uh, 8,000 people in 40 or 50 nations who have the expertise and are prepared to, to, to guide, and advise, and to help. And you've got this group. Uh, that publishes out of the University of Wellington. Geographers are very heavily involved in it um, in New Zealand. Let me just finish off New Zealand by referring to the, the bottom island, or the two bottom islands on that, on that map, Macquarie, which is an Australian island halfway to Antarctica from Hobart, and then the Cam, uh, Campbell Island. <coughs> Campbell Island is part of a subantarctic set of heritage sites that New Zealand has. I'd love to go there. They're very, very cold, very difficult to get to. <clears throat> but what was happened was that Campbell Island was, was the one in the turn of this millennium to be tackled as a, as a large island. You can see it's 28,000 acres. And it was a piecemeal attempt. It had been, all these islands tend to be go back to the sealing and whaling eras when you have the people coming ashore to take the fur seals, the elephant seals, any whales that they could take. In the case of Campbell, they were also settled, settled by Scottish shepherds who were trying to run sheep on it and did successfully until the 1930s when uh, a drop in whale full pri uh, wool prices uh, forced them to abandon the sheep and they just walked off. So there were a lot of feral livestock on Campbell and these were quite easily removed, including rabbits, rabbits actually, that people were introduced, uh, interested in keeping because of the species that they, sort of the genes that pool they represented. But then they went into and tackled the, 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 the rodents. And as you see, uh, when they discovered from doing it and a very successful campaign, a new species of snipe was discovered in 1997, the albatross, named after that island, has done better. And this flightless teal was also reintroduced. And uh, there are 2,000 individuals now uh, breeding, uh, estimated to be on that, on that island. 
having been captively bred on the mainland and then taken and, and reintroduced to this very difficult and very isolated place. So Campbell was considered to be, and is considered to be, one of the, the sort of um, classic, recent classic statements about what you can do if you do it progressively and comprehensively and do it with a lot of, of uh, care and forethought. Macquarie is another island that has just been successfully cleared. It has, as you see, a whole bunch or had a whole bunch of introduced species, including cats that were finally got rid of. But the trouble with cats uh, was that they also fed on the rabbits as well as the seabirds. And once the cats had been removed, the rabbits just multiplied and became uh, estimated 100,000 of them on, on Macquarie once the cats had gone on. So it's sort of a, a trophic cascade, as I describe here. And so what they did, this is a sort of before and after. You see A and B and C and D, the, the same place with rabbit, um, rabbit grazing, browsing, grazing, so intense that it really caused a great deal of problem. So the eradication in 2010 is now complete. And it, is, uh, it has not only taken out rabbits, it has also taken out the rats and hopefully the mice. And so as of uh, my latest information I have on, on, on this, and I'm way behind, I've lost my place, but that's OK. Um, this is, yeah, completed July. 2011, in August or September of that year, 13 rabbits were found on Macquarie. And what you do is go in and you chase them individually and you get bait, bait stations over. So basically, as of now, the, they think that Macquarie is now, has got rid of these four invasives that have had huge impacts on the native seabird populations in particular. So the Australians have benefited from the, uh, from the collaboration and understanding of the Kiwis, and it is a very good understanding indeed. And it has been a very expensive, the, the Tasmanian government owns much of Macquarie and was very reluctant to do anything because it didn't, so it didn't have the money. So a lot of help was given to it, not only by the Commonwealth government, but also by agencies uh, around, the, around the globe. The New Zealanders are now actively going into South Georgia, one of the places I'd love to go to. If I ever get enough money to do it, I'd, I'd love to join one of those, those wonderful trips you can take to Antarctica. To help with Antarctica, you go to the islands around Antarctica, South Georgia being probably the most magnificent of all. The problem with South Georgia, apart from Shackleton and, and so on and so forth, is that it has a lot of problems with rats and mice. And so, with help from our friends, the, the New Zealanders, we've started to, the Brits have started to take on uh, South Georgia. All these were established in these railing stations uh, that were springing up and working right through to the 1930s, were mostly run by Norwegians. So these were land-based stations, and of course, the rats came ashore and just made mincemeat of the local seabird populations. And you can see that even the, the uh, Scandinavia introduced reindeer into parts of South Georgia as well. What can we say then in terms of some of the things that are going on? The, 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 the places in black are now Australasia. And they, they, they tend to dominate the invasive species and control scenario, and we've got a lot to learn. I like to look at the literature, the symposia, and so on, the people who are actually there on the ground doing the work on Macquarie and on South Georgia. On the Falklands are now going to be looked at, and some are being cleared, hopefully piecemeal, island by island. So this is a very exciting area that I think uh, is, is at hand. And, and people I've talked to say it isn't just the New Zealanders, it's people from New Zealand going into other places, especially in the Pacific, and talking to the indigenous societies, indigenous decision makers, and getting them uh, on board and, and helping them take you know, life or death into their own hands so they can, they can start to rehabilitate populations of plants and animals on those islands as well. For example, this is one of them ongoing as we speak. And Pinzon and 
I forget the other one. I have to look in my notes. But you know, they've, they've been shooting, shooting goats. They've been doing a lot. And this is a, a World Heritage Site everybody goes to, but it is the most endangered World Heritage Site on the planet today because of invasive species. I'm not just talking about the populated island. I'm talking about uh, islands that have been populated by especially rodents. And so we've got Ecuador uh, joining into this, to this uh, real effort and trying to do the same things that have been done elsewhere. So you've got a, con you've got a control, a management, and a possible an eradication program and policy and institutional structure. What you need now in New Zealand is a public buy-in. And that means the health, the law enforcement, uh, the immigration people, the transportation people are alert and trying to, to watch what happens so that we don't get reinvasion. We don't get these pathways which are increasingly well understood in terms of um, container ships in terms of ports and airports and so on. We don't want to get reinvaded in a sense because the costs of that are, are quite astronomical. So there are a, a whole uh, bunch of um, rules and regulations that you've got, as I say, have the public to buy into so that they, they willingly uh, undergo these searches or questions about bringing things in from elsewhere. The hot spots remain, though, with these multi-huge tankers that are going very, very quickly indeed. Um, this whole problem of invasiveness is, is here to stay. These are just shipping routes across. And there you see New Zealand on the bottom left. But look at, look at California. Look at Hawaii, which has already been, uh, already been very, very uh, involved and badly um, invaded by a whole bunch of organisms, and look at uh, I mean, look at the uh, Fukushima, the, the, the tsunami. We wasn't it we picked up uh, one of these piers on the coast of Oregon, wasn't it, with all the various seaweeds on it, several months after the the event. So these these things move not just through our own shipping routes, but also according to tide, weather, and current. And when you add the air, and this is presumably how the brown tree state got into Guam, through the military exchanges, and the, through, through particularly getting aboard aircraft and the undercarriages and so on, very adept at well, then you can see that this is a problem, as I said, that is likely to intensify. On an international level, I think it's, it's interesting to examine some of the codices, some of the regimes. I think the Convention of Biological Diversity is an extremely good one to look at because it has, as part of its rubric, uh, an appeal to have, to have uh, subscribers, to have members uh, take care of and to look at very hard the problem of invasive plants and animals in the nations that have signed on. This is something that needs its own uh, dialogue. And the America, America, the US, is, is, is partially involved in this and is a good data collector for so. Europe is involved in this in, a, in, in quite a, a large degree. DAISY is the, is the inventory responsible for it. As you see, there's a lot of material being collected. The whole inventory aspect of it, 12,000 plus alien species in Europe, how many of them are invasive? I'm not yet sure, but we're dealing with uh, another EU, another sort of subcontinent that is, is geared up for looking at this problem in some detail. I mentioned this, this uh, organism is just one of them. I'm very familiar with it, so are you. But this is where the Canada goose is today. Not just in Britain where it was introduced, but it's got, uh, and it is considered to be invasive because of its competition, because of the economic costs associated with it as well. This, thank goodness, I've just seen one yesterday at Laguna, at Laguna Gloria. They're still on Lake Austin, munching away. Thank God the Brits got rid of this. By very careful and elaborate uh, planning, they managed to get rid of it. But the, the new tree is alive and well in much of Europe and doing very well, thank you. 
What impact is having locally? Well, it's a question of where you go and who you talk to, but it certainly is considered to be an invasive species. The Brits haven't done so well with other organisms, and there is, a, as you see, a special um, government secretariat now that worries about this and talks about this and advises about this. In fact, my uh, daughter-in-law, uh, my, my niece, my niece, I'm sorry, is involved in this because she works for the government and can talk to me about this quite effectively. But look at this damn thing, you know. Poor old red squirrel on the Isle of Wight, the only place in England you can go and see red squirrels. Native squirrels on the Isle of Wight. This thing here introduced as a, as a bit of a laugh, you know, a bit of a, a, bit of a giggle, introduced in Cheshire in 1876, carries squirrel pox. Bigger. Is largely immune to its own pox, but the great red squirrel isn't. It can't survive with grey squirrels. So there's a squirrel problem in the UK. And you can see that this on the distribution map. And the Scots are very upset because that's one of the few places in the Highlands where you can have a nice, good, nice malt and see a red squirrel. More than you can do on the Isle of Wight. But there you go. The Scots are very worried about squirrels. And there's a survival trust for squirrels. So when you go over there next... Beware of the grey squirrel. Squirrel dumplings are always good, they tell me. <laughs> the other thing, I mentioned this bird, I won't do it again, I'm just fed up with that bird. But this is an interesting bird. <laughs> this is the American mink. This is the American mink. I've seen this in Iceland, mink farming. In Iceland, 1900, 1930. The Brits did the same thing. Mink farming, wonderful. Let's have mink farms. There it is. And now... In the case of Scotland, the whole fisheries crowd, all the fisheries trust, they're always, they're, they're really not in bed with the mink anymore. The mink is something that is a scourge, is a real problem because it's so crafty, so clever. And so they have now, even on the Outer Hebrides where I was this summer, they've been taking on the mink, trapping mink, and they're clearing island after island by using mink dogs, by watching mink, looking for mink, tracking mink, and out minking mink. And so basically, they're trying to deal with the American mink. Tr tricky, difficult, very, very difficult, much harder than the Nanutria. And it is a very, very effective predator, as you know, uh, in, in, um, in areas where nesting birds are, especially on the ground. And finally, just let me touch base uh, with Texas. Texas has... Uh, because it's the biological crossroads, it's the largest state, it has a, a huge diversity, it is a very interesting place to be, as we all know, and it is very much involved and in becoming more so through the, the um, Lady Bird Johnson group, um, National, the Wildflower Center and others, uh, in, in dealing and identifying. We have people on this campus who are and, and worrying about <laughs> fire ants and so forth. Larry Gilbert's people. But, and we have, of course, problems of this. We have more feral hogs than any other state. We probably have half the, the US total, which is about 6 million. So there are 2 to 3 million feral hogs hoggling about Texas, and none of them are being protected. In fact, we have now Governor Perry gave permission to hunt hogs by helicopter. Although, who is the guy in the, the guy, was it? The guy in the Austin Statesman, the hunting guy, he said, that's not fair, you shouldn't do that. It's not hunting. It's not fair, you just shot shit them from a helicopter. It's not honest hunting. But so we, we've got hogs. We've got a disease problem with hogs or associated with hogs. You cannot, you've got to send your hogs you trap to a, to a, a butchery alive. Otherwise, you can't sell them. They can't be slaughtered. You can't shoot them in the field unless you're going to field dress them yourself. So it's trickiness because of the disease problem. A lot of this meat that can be used, and Europeans are being encouraged to eat wild hog, Texas hog, feral hog. And uh, that's the same thing with the lionfish. There's an attempt now to make lionfish um, palatable, and especially in the Caribbean, if they're carefully prepared. So we have our, we have our hog problem. We have uh, our other problems as well. And so this is... 
Partly, you know, we've got zebra mussels in the paper last week, I believe. Where are they now? They're somewhere like Denison, the Red River now. They're, they're, they've crept down out of the Black Sea into the Great Lakes, and now they're invade, invading Texas. We've got Parks and Wildlife, the Department of Health, and the Department of Agriculture, who are the key players in, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Well, the hog is, I think the fire ant isn't doing too badly. Although I think Larry Gilbert and others are, are trying to work very hard on that. The hog is ubiquitous. I think it's very well widespread like the rat, like rats are. The question is, cats are a very difficult problem because um, you've got the, the no-kill policies, and you've got the neutral release policies. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting literature about that, that the cat people tend to be more sympathetic with the bird people than the bird people are with the cat people. And so I tend to be on the side of the bird people and not terribly sympathetic with the cat people. The argument being that, yeah, you, you spay and neuter, yeah, but the thing's still going to be catching birds. And I, I want to save my birds, I guess. And so the, the statistics are, quite, are quite, quite significant, actually, when you talk about what people do and how, how many birds are thought to be uh, preyed on about cats, both here and, and elsewhere. It's, it's quite staggering in terms of numbers. So, I don't know what the answer is. It's going to be something you have to work on. And the guy in New Zealand says, all right, we've got 50% of the population have cats. I don't want death, too many death threats. He's had some. Let me employ you to keep your cat indoors. That's, I guess, his way of trying try to keep them away, or, or away, of, away as far as possible from the, the native species. But uh, it is a very tricky is um, and using and using uh, poisons of one kind or other what what are the indirect effects including on us well obviously the on us is something that you either get the people out of there or you talk to them or you start to to have a ne negotiation but on many of these islands the endemic species are also subject and they try to for example in Campbell Island they try to go in the off season when in the winter, which is hard for them, but better for the animals, when the, the native fauna, in particular the albatrosses, are not there, or very few of them are. But you do have knock-on effects. The argument will be, well, all right, these are scavengers. They'll, they'll recover, and they by and large do. But, but it is a, a problem you have to really take into, into great consideration of. You can't just go out there and expect the, the, the not non-pests, the native species, to, to be immune to what goes on. They're not. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming.